Good morning and welcome to this discussion on addressing the drivers of eco-anxiety. Uh, this session is also being live streamed on the World Economic Forum website and the website of the Straits Times in Singapore. Uh, I'm Warren Fernandez and I'm Editor-in-Chief of the Straits Times based in Singapore. Uh, some of you will know that Singapore is a small island state based in Southeast Asia and for us climate change and sea level rise is an existential challenge. Uh, we do a regular podcast on sustainability, sustainability issues called Green Pulse, and it is one of the most popular, most downloaded uh, podcasts that we have, showing the interest and uh, concern on this issue. Uh, there's been many discussions we've had in Davos, you know, about the war in Ukraine, about energy prices and food prices, uh, global politics, but under, looming behind all of that is the issue of climate change, which is real and it's relentless but it's also giving rise to a certain degree of anxiety amongst our people. A recent global study of 10,000 young people, 16 to 25 in 10 countries, revealed some very troubling findings. Six in 10 said they were either very or extremely worried about climate change. Over half used words like sad, anxious, angry, helpless, or guilty to describe how they were feeling about climate change. 77% considered the future frightening. More than half said they felt that humanity is doomed. And 65% felt that fighting, that the governments were failing them and not doing enough to tackle this issue. So we want to spend this, the first part of our session this morning discussing this issue of eco-anxiety and then going on to looking at what we might do about this anxiety and how we can help turn anxiety to agency and then action. And to do that, I have a very inspiring group of uh, individuals here on my panel. Um, I've just met them and I found their story so interesting. I, I'm sure you will uh, during the discussion. Let me just introduce them very, very briefly. Uh, from my left, um, first of all, Elizabeth Wasuti, who is the founder of the Green Generation Initiative in Kenya. Then Ina Moja, who is a land ambassador with the United Nations Convention to, Con to Combat Desertification. And then Kahea Pacheco, who is a co-director of the Women's Earth Alliance from the USA. And last but not least, David Dow, who is a World Economic Forum Global Shaper and also a researcher at the ETH here in Zurich. First, let's, let's talk about eco-anxiety. I mean, it's an issue which, which is out there, but I'd like to get a sense from, from you because you, you work in this space. So let me start with Elizabeth. You know, you've, you've heard the, the findings, you've seen the video young people saying they feel helpless and angry and guilty. Tell me a little bit about your connection, the people you speak and, and work with. How does that anxiety manifest itself and what do you think is driving it? I think eco-anxiety is an issue that we have often failed to actually give a priority because it's happening, it's affecting so many young people. And from my point of view, I've spent the past few days talking about the humanitarian crisis in the Horn of Africa. And these are things that we see every day and not impacts that we are waiting to experience in the future. It's about the drought situation that is impacting women, children, and communities that have least contributed to this crisis. And of course, these are people who are also losing hope for their future because right now they're already facing these worst impacts. And the reason why young people are anxious, it's not because of the fact that science says that things are going to be catastrophic, it's because what people are doing and what we see the leaders doing is still far much away from what science says we must do. And if we see that there's that delay in action, then that's what causes uh, the anxiety because sometime back somebody asks if we should begin to communicate differently about the climate crisis. And I said, no, we're not afraid of the truth of what science says about these impacts. What makes us anxious is the fact that science says that the problem is this huge and it will only become more catastrophic if nothing is done and still we don't see action being taken. And what we see is these communities really continuing to be greatly impacted. And also, we say a lot that governments are seen as failing to respond adequately to this problem. But again, this is not just a perception that is among the anxious young people, as we say it. It's a plain and undeniable truth. And we've heard it from different people, from the scientific community, from even the UN Secretary General, and many other people will attest to this, that this is the truth. And it's actually an undeniable truth that we have to move faster if we want to also address 
this issue of eco-anxiety. And again, it's about acknowledging it, that young people have every right to be angry, to be frustrated, and to actually demand for action, because this is about their future. This is about a future that is not guaranteed with the way in which things are being done today. You spoke at COP26 and made the point that governments weren't doing enough. Is that a strong feeling that you're hearing from people all around you? Definitely, governments are not doing enough because if they were doing enough, then this humanitarian crisis would not be worsening. It's been almost half a year since COP26 where leaders met and what we are seeing is the fact that this crisis still continues to impact people on the front lines. And this is a truth that we are not the only ones that are saying it. This is a truth that is being felt by people on the front lines. And again, they have been attending these negotiations and making pledges even before I was born. And the fact that we still see not much being done is a big challenge to all of us that we need to be doing much more because emissions are still rising. So how is it that we can say that governments are doing enough and yet we are still so much far away from what Sun says we must do? Thanks, Elizabeth. Let me bring it in now. You've, you've heard words like you know, feeling sad and anxious and angry and powerless and helpless. Tell me how, how, you, how that strikes you. I, mean. I think that it's very important to include young people in the conversation, to really work with them and give them the opportunity to be part of not just the conversation, but also in doing something. Because uh, it's generation before that created what we are in right now. And we are still facing the fact that there is not a real bridge between this generation and the younger one. And we've seen them in the streets around the world coming out saying that they want to be heard, they want to participate in to do consumption. And they are holding people accountable, people who are leaders. And the leadership, unfortunately, has failed them. They, has fa they have failed them. And so I completely understand when you watch the news, the cycle of news, it can become super anxious because we are just talking about the problem and not the solutions. Or sometimes when we talk about the solutions, it's just words. And action needs to follow words. We need to act on it. Otherwise, this generation is going to hold us accountable and uh, you know, rightfully so. David, you're a global shaper with the WEF and watching that video, which I think you helped put together as well, and the references to the vulnerability and the fragility of the planet and young people having this sense of foreboding. You were telling me earlier that you, having been in Davos all week, also felt this sense of you know, impatience. You know. Tell us a little bit about that, that sentiment. So I'm born and raised in Germany. I'm representing the Global North, but my parents are refugees from Vietnam. And that reminds me and connects me very deeply to the climate crisis, which is not about nature, it's not about climate, it's about the people. The climate crisis, the United Nations High Refugee Council estimates that a billion refugees, a billion people all around the world by 2050 will be displaced. These are, and I know, coming from a family such as this, I know what it means to lose home, to have to start new, to be uncertain and to face danger and conflicts and potentially death. And growing up in the global north, I, of course, started to trust my leaders and say, okay, uh, we, we're going to make it like we, ha we elect we have democracy, we elect the most comp competent potentially leaders, business leaders, uh, political leaders. Um, we have to raise some funds to get to solve the climate crisis. $100 billion a year was pledged, right? And again and again and again over the years, I've seen they failing by re-pledging, seen failing to keep up the promise of reducing deforestation by 2030, by re-pledging the same pledge in Glasgow. And seemed even failing, we need, don't need $100 billion, we need trillions of dollars. But saying, okay, sorry, we don't have the money, we don't know how to save it in our economy, um, in education. But then what struck me and what really, really struck my trust is that when the COVID pandemic ha happened and there was another crisis that affected them directly um, and also the wealth of the, of, of the developed nations, suddenly, $15,000 billion was raised in a year. And this is money that is borrowed by future generations, by us. So not only are they not willing to raise the money to protect the climate, but they are also taking our financial freedom in the future because this money needs to be paid back. And also, talking about money, and this is one of the things I want to bring in this last part, 
this is not how young people think. I really don't like to tell when I go to a panel and say, plant a tree for a, do a, a dollar, you will get back eight dollars. Or, okay, here, nature is like the biggest investment opportunity we've seen so far to in attract more of these finances because the hundred, hundred, these hundred billion dollars are not grants, they are loans where countries and investors expect a return. So they, they are not like for free. And I don't understand why, and this is, a, this is a discrepancy between how young people think, because we look at the crisis as an existential crisis, existential crisis, as a moral crisis, as something that affects us as people, the lives that live there. But instead, in order to convince our leaders, we need to state it as a business case to make sure like the global south is like a business opportunity. They are not. These leaders from the global south, they are our superheroes. They are actually protecting us right now from a climate crisis by preserving forests, nature, and so on. And this is something that has to be mentioned here. Thanks, David. Kahir, you work with uh, young people and women in 24 countries. Is that sense of this being a moral, moral crisis something that comes to the fore? Absolutely, this is a moral crisis. And I guess I can start with sharing a story. Um, <clears throat> on September 9th, 2020, uh, my, my son was born and I woke up at 9 a.m. that morning with enough time to make it to the hospital. Um, but when I opened my eyes, I remember wondering if I slept through the day or did I wake up way too early um, because it was, it was pitch black. Um, so I went to the window and I looked outside and it was like the apocalypse had hit. Um, and this is in Northern California. Um, there was, it was 9 a.m. and there was no daylight. It might as well have been 11 p.m. The sky outside was dark and orange and there was particles of ash kind of just floating around. And this is because we're in such a severe drought and have had such a lack of water and rainfall um, in the Western, in Western North America that fires from British Columbia all the way down to California had just ravaged the region in, in the weeks prior and, and the air quality, this was, this was the result. We'd all started speaking this different language about air quality index, like, oh, what's your AQI today? What sensor are you using to test your AQI? Have you been outside? Does your chest hurt? Did you breathe outside? These are all questions that had become part of our common conversation. And on that morning when I woke up and looked outside, I remember thinking, is this the world I'm bringing this child into? Is this what we are leaving future generations? And, and that story, that, that experience is not unique to me. It's, it's by no means unique to my region. The women we work with in Kalimantan, Indonesia, face that kind of air quality and those black and orange skies on a daily basis because of the, the fires in the forests there, fires that are set to burn forests, to clear it, and to drain peatlands for agriculture. Um, and these, this is just one example of the health and mental impacts of climate change on communities. There are many more. And in many times, it's, it's women who face these, these things the most because climate change is a threat multiplier. It exacerbates existing inequities, including gender inequity. And so we look, you know, you were saying about um, a billion refugees. 80% um, of the world's climate refugees are currently women. Um, and women are 14 times more likely to die in climate-related events than anyone else. Um, and it's not just, I want to be clear, it's not just climate change impacts, it's climate-inducing industries that are causing harm and, and bringing about this eco-anxiety in our communities. Um, in indigenous communities in North America, for example, that have been inundated by industry and chemicals have leaked into our lands, um, our soils, and our water. Women are finding that they are passing PCBs onto their children through their breast milk. That leads to just this generational trauma of, of pollution. You know, we, we are carrying a body burden, a cumulative body burden of pollutants, 
and we're passing that on to our children and as young people to understand that that's what we, that's what we have, that's, that's our legacy, that's what we're inheriting. No wonder everybody is suffering from eco-anxiety and I think one of the distinctions to make here is when that eco-anxiety, when that anxiety and that anxious feeling turns into resignation and into paralysis. Um, and something that we've seen in our work that has personally been helpful to me is this recognition that for a lot of frontline communities, they do not have the luxury of paralysis. They do not have the privilege to be stuck in resignation because if they are not taking action, if they are not continually b believing in and building their resilience, their survival is on the line, their survival of their children, their survival of their communities. So there is a power dynamic even here when we're dealing with eco-anxiety and, and climate doomism, um, really. But, but I think of that um, when I kind of think of those questions of, you know, is this the world I'm leaving my child? Is this what we're leaving to our future generations? And, and in the end, the answer is, is yes, because even just within Women's Earth Alliance's global network, I know at least 12,000 frontline women leaders who are not stopping. They are not sitting in that paralysis. They are, they are maintaining resilience, or they're building resilience and maintaining hope that they can change a system. And I think what has been clear this past week at Davos is that we need more. We need more from this community here. Um, we need more from decision makers like, like Liz has been talking about, and we need it faster. Thanks, uh, Kea. That story about you, know, you bring a baby into the world in, in, in that, that backdrop is something that I certainly can, can identify with because you know, I live in Singapore and from time to time we get the haze blowing into our, our city and there's nothing you can do about it and you start to worry about the, the very air you're breathing in and it's, it's real, it's, it's there for you. But I wanted to get a sense from all of you. you know, you've been here in Davos and you've been hearing about you know, the Euro Ukraine war and, and cost of food and energy. Does that cause you to feel that you know, these issues which are so close to your hearts are starting to be sort of pushed to the sidelines and no longer front and center of people's minds. That, does that cause greater anxiety, any of you? I think um, for me it causes anxiety in that I worry that those uh, at the decision-making table, those currently at the decision-making tables don't understand how interrelated all of these crises are, they're, they're completely interwoven. So addressing one helps to address another. And actually to address one, you often have to address multiple crises at once. And if we don't, we are not going to create a sustainable planet in which we can live peacefully and, and alongside one another. Okay. You know, we haven't heard from you yet, yeah? I think that it is, um I actually want to fight even more because uh, I'm past the anxious moment and uh, coming from a continent where, you know, in, in a few years we will double our population. Like you were saying, we don't have time to wait to find solutions because the planet is not waiting, the climate is changing. Mm. And so we, we are in a race where we really have to fight to make our voice heard. And uh, it is super, super, super important that we keep pressuring the leadership and we keep press pressing them to address all the different uh, issues that are tied to climate. And we cannot just, like you were saying, we cannot just talk about one thing. It opens the door for different uh, situations. I come from uh, the Sahel in, uh, in Mali. Half of my country is, uh, is the desert. And there are so many people who are facing terrorism and different conflicts because that is also one of the things that climates create. It's all the, the insecurity and, and, and stable environment. And um, I've traveled from uh, Senegal to Ethiopia, all along the Sahel, all along the Sahara, to spend time with communities who are living in the deserthood and who are fighting daily to survive, who are fighting daily to create solutions that are sustainable and will help uh, protect their families and uh, the, where they live. And I realized that when we talk about climate change and we don't address the forced migration, 
we don't address the fact that because of uh, the fact that they don't have access to water and they have to walk miles to go and get water. Education, how do young people can go to school when they are going to get water? When are women going to be able to work and have um, independence freedom, financial freedom, to instead of going to find water? These are all things that are so important and they are all very tight. When I, I, I now live between uh, Mali and Lisbon, and so I, I can see both sides. And uh, when I think about how it's so easy for me to just open the tap, I didn't grow up uh, in places where it was that easy. But now I think about it, the way that I am living and a lot of us are living, the modern life that we are living contribute to the burden that uh, these communities are carrying now because they are the ones who suffer it the most, pos the most and they are the less who are contributing to it. And uh, we cannot just uh, address things like in, um, in such a, how do we say that? In, I'm thinking in French, sorry. <laughs> in, in, it's not separate. It's all together, and we have one planet, and we have to care about uh, this butterfly effect. And so to me, it's when I talk about climate, I talk about people. I talk about everything that they are facing. And uh, when I uh, start the news everywhere, we talk a lot about migrants. It's so important that we start changing our vocabulary. It, these are climate refugees, and everything that they are facing are intertwined. And uh, for me, it is, uh, it, it's, it's really more than time. Time has passed already for action, so we just have to go in these meetings and uh, also on the ground and keep, keep pushing, keep pushing. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of us are anxious, but we don't have time to, to sit, we just have to go. Okay, so time is, is not on our side and we've got to find ways to turn this anxiety into agency and action and not give in to, to resignation. Absolutely. I'd like to sort of transition uh, into a second part of our discussion which is to look at how we've moved, how we can move and inspire people to, to, to step up and take action and, and own the challenge. And I, I'd like to show you a little clip um, from uh, Studio Silverback's program called Seat at the Table. And this is a series with the climate change activist, Jack Harris, and it's an episode called Let's Talk About Climate Change. Could we have the clip, please? Climate anxiety. It's not an easy thing to talk about. But what's become clear to me is that it's a huge issue for people all around the world. Knowing what's coming is uh, really frightening. Someone and is sitting on my chest. How much I worry, how much I feel. A sort of guilt that comes really hopeless. What can I do? What's going to happen? So I want to understand what we can do about it. It's so important that we use this anxiety to turn it into action. And how ultimately we can build tools for resilience. Grief is a good feeling to go through because you'll come out of it stronger. No matter who you are, it's becoming clear to me that climate anxiety is easier to cope with when you know others also share those feelings. It is not something that we are alone in. We are all fighting it and feeling that anxiety together. We could be on the sustainability revolution. This shared climate anxiety by my generation, that is gonna be a massive force of willpower to push us in a positive direction. I want to discover if it's possible to turn climate anxiety from a rational but paralyzing fear into a force for change. So turning it from a paralyzing fear into a force for change. And on, on this panel, we have four individuals who have done just that and uh, really inspiring stories which they've been telling me about, which I'd really like them to share with you. Maybe Elizabeth, you can start uh, by telling us about how you founded the Green Generation Initiative, you know, which tries to build a generation of environmental uh, enthusiasts through activities like tree planting and, and others. Tell us how you did that. I think one of the things that eco anxiety does and feeling anxious, angry, and frustrated about what you see is the fact that 
it also gives you a natural call to action to want to do something and to want to use your voice to change things around you. Because how can you not be angry, frustrated and anxious when you spend time with communities who are grieving the loss of their lives and their livelihoods as well, and people who are on the front line? Because we look at anxiety in terms of being afraid of the future when there's also anxiety in terms of what people are facing right now, people who have faced losses, people who depend on 80% of their livelihoods from livestock that have been swept away by the floods or have had to die due to a prolonged drought. And one of the reasons why I founded this initiative was because I learned how to turn my anger into a hunger to want to do are around me. And I think to me, this is how we could continue to really make sure that anxiety is actually a powerful fuel that gets us to do something. But again, we cannot leave this work to just a small group of young people or activists or people who are concerned about this. This has to be everyone's uh, problem that everybody has to do something about it. So when I founded this initiative, I actually remember feeling angry about how people were treating nature because I have always been close to the forest landscape, always been close to the trees and clean streams and seeing people destroying the wild forests and ecosystems made me angry. But again, you will not feel angry if you're not connected to the earth ecosystems and what's around you. Because when you are connected to something, when you love something, you'll step up to protect it. And so for the past years, we have been helping over 20,000 children to love nature and to also grow trees in their own school compounds. And these are not just trees that they're growing, it's because they are also impacted by food insecurity. So we figured out ways on how we can make sure that they pick corners in the designated school compounds and then they can plant mixed species of fruit trees that would ensure that they have something nutritious for them to eat at the end of the day. But again, these are children who are living in a country that has been greatly impacted by this crisis and also every day they are breathing toxic air, every day they are also you know, afraid of the future because when they look outside their school compounds where they're planting trees, they still see big businesses and corporations fueling deforestation and burning fossil fuels. And these are things that still continue to undermine the very efforts they're trying to do within their own schools. So we have to see this as a larger, you know, problem that everybody has to be involved because as much as we're trying to run these initiatives back at home with our communities, these trees that we are growing with these children are not going to survive in a 2.7 degrees warmer planet. So it's a whole big problem that we are doing what we can, but we also need everybody to get behind this generation. And we need people who have a bigger capacity and much more resources to also do much more so that together we can create that livable world and a safe future for all, for all of us and also for the children and generations to come. It's such a powerful phrase that you use, turning your anger into that hunger to do something. And I think something that stuck in my mind. Ina, tell me a little bit about the work you did with the UN. And you, you worked on this documentary called The Great Green Wall. Mm -hmm. And you actually presented the documentary as well. So tell us about that and what impact it made. So I'm from the Sahel. For me, it was very important to, to go into these communities and spend time with them and understand because I'm from the Sahel, but I was born and I grew up in, in the capital of Mali. So my reality, even though my family comes from the northern part of Mali, and uh, we are people from the desert, but my most of my life I was in a, in, in a big city, very polluted, but I didn't have to face uh, what the communities in the desert are facing on daily. And so I wanted to spend time and travel in the desert. So I, for, for years, I was in Senegal, in Niger, in, in Nigeria. I spent, um, you know, I did this journey 8,000 kilometers from Senegal to Ethiopia and because I wanted to understand the reality of it. I wanted to see with my own high eyes and be able to um, give them a platform and give them a voice to share their stories because as an African, I, I was feeling that I had enough of a narrative that was already written for us, and I wanted people who are living it daily to be able to tell us how it is and, and what they can contribute, uh, how they can contribute in making a change, because we have to give them the power to do that. We have to give them the opportunity to, to uh, be part of this conversation and be part of the action even more. 
And, uh, and so the Great Green Wall aims to restore 100 million hectares of land. So it's uh, about land restoration. We have to start with land. Land is one of the most important things ever. And so in doing so, we enable communities to, not, to stop surviving, because a lot of people are surviving. And if we don't do anything, millions are going to be displaced. And we see them going already. I've met with people in, uh, in Agadez, in uh, Niger, people who, were, who had this dream of um, going through the desert and then going to the Mediterranean Sea and coming to Europe. And when they arrive to Europe, uh, I see all this uh, um, you know, new cycle where, oh, the migrants are here. What are they going to do? Uh, they are fleeing because of climate change. And uh, it is super important that we create a space where all the voices are part of this. It is very, very important. The Great Green Wall is not just about planting trees, it's about giving another opportunity to people by funding the uh, grassroots solutions, uh, the, the community-driven solutions, by empowering women because more than 50% of uh, women work, uh, people working in these communities are women. And only 3% of these women have ownership of land. And so we really have to create a more balanced uh, environment for, for the women who are working this hard. And so for me, it is a, we, we aim to uh, achieve the Great Green Wall in 2030, but I think that it's a life mission because I have a two years old and I want her to grow in a world where she's not fighting what the fight that we're doing today. I'm fighting the fight that my mom and my grandmother were doing. And so it has to stop because otherwise we, we're just going until we're going to burn everything and it doesn't make sense. So one of these uh, solutions, climate solutions, uh, might be the Great Green Wall. There might be others that uh, we need to support, but we need to give the, 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 the power to the people because they are at the heart of any project, and they are the ones who are going to make it happen. It's a very compelling uh, documentary. I, I commend it to all of you. Go Google it and, and watch it. And you'll also find, if you Google, Ina is a, is a performing musician. She does Mali blues, right, you said. Yes. So you might catch a few videos of that and her music as well. But Kea, tell us about your work in empowering women to, to deal with this issue. Yeah, um, I think history has shown us that powerful grassroots organizing is a vital lever in creating uh, major social changes. Just in the US alone, we can look at the civil rights movement as an example. Um, and grassroots solutions come from working directly with the communities who are impacted by climate change. And so the solutions often will address economic, social, and environmental issues simultaneously because a community is always looking at all of these things. They're looking at everything in a holistic nature so, because they're trying to ensure their health and well-being. Um, and I just want to note that, you know, over the week, I've heard a lot about partnerships with, you know, corporations, companies partnering with each other, partnering with tech, partnering with states. And that's well and good and, and important. This has been the first time I've heard so much about community work and centering community work which if we are serious about addressing climate change, centering community work is, is vital, it is critical. It is, these are the solutions that are going to move the needle. Um, and, and more, you know, when solutions rise from the grassroots, it honors and it reinforces people's agencies, their ability to create change, their, their, it grows resilience. Um, action begets action. And so at Women's Earth Alliance, we partner with community-based organizations and women leaders who are on the front lines of climate change and environmental injustice. And we invest in their long-term leadership in, and in their solutions um, with capacity building trainings, with um, sustainable livelihood development, if, if that's what the, the community is calling for, with funding and with a global network of support. And, and through that, these community-based solutions, these women-led community-based climate solutions are really rising from the grassroots up. Um, and they're addressing multiple crises. Like I was saying earlier, you know, it's, it's addressing more than one thing at a time. Um, and 
a good example of that is our COVID and climate resilience uh, program, which we did in partnership with a community-based organization called Women in Water and Natural Resource Conservation in Kenya. And we have been working with that organization. We have a long-standing partnership of more than a decade. Um, so there's a lot of trust built there. And at the time when we launched this program, communities in the region were dealing with climate impacts, locust outbreak, um, the pandemic, and flooding that took out bridges that the government was using to get supplies and, and food in. And so those supplies and that food were delayed or just were not guaranteed to ever come. And the women in the community were mobilizing. Um, our partner, uh, in collaboration with our partner, we set up a plan for short and long-term um, resilience programming, short and long-term solutions. Um, our partner transformed their office space into a food and supplies distribution center. Um, we mobilized women we had worked with in the region, community leaders in the region, um, who had already gone through some, some training on water and sanitation and health. And they established hand washing stations and trainings on water collection and filtration. They set up seed banks for climate resilient seeds to ensure that community always had access to seeds, that they could grow their own food and, and stop reliance on government food aid. Um, they created a health clinic and they established tree nurseries and, and fruit tree nurseries um, to fight deforestation, but to also provide an income and a food source. And all of that is possible because of the mobilization of the grassroots, because of women's leadership at the grassroots. Um, and because of that, we were able to replicate that kind of work, um, making it very community specific in more than nine countries. So the importance of bringing the communities to the table to help solve the problem. Not just bringing them to the table, but having them be the most important and the first voice at the table. David, you, you work in a tech space. You're also a researcher in AI, and you're sort of founder of a startup called Gained Forest. Now, tell us about that work. So we looked into why existing programs like United Nations, of course, know about the problem of deforestation. Everyone knows about this. Even people who have worked in this space and before I was born, this problem is known. The science is there. Why do we not get the right funds through, right? And looking at this problem, attending, talking to climate negotiators and people who work in that space and also communities, one thing became clear to me that the reason why we don't have enough funds is because there's a mistrust between p communities and between donors, between the whole system, how the money can go from one spot to the other. So what we did um, and what, that, um, what Gainforce is doing, this is a startup that resulted from many, many years of research in the technology space in ETH Zurich, as well as working and talking with indigenous communities in Brazil, Southeast Asia, and uh, um, South America, is, uh, in Paraguay, is um, that we developed technology solutions, specifically leveraging first AI-based technology. We take satellite data, remote sensing, to look at preserved areas and exactly measure the impact, not in the sense of like how much carbon is there, but like in many other areas, like what are the species that are supposed to be living there natively? Like how clean is the water getting? Like we try to derive many, many sources of data, hundreds of sources of them, combine them together using sophisticated algorithms to really give a clear picture for the communities to empower their work on that space in any area in the world, as well as also for the donors, investors, and people who want to help to see that there is actually impact in there. So, but then we also try to self, solve one more problem, which is a community specific one, which is when the community is putting their work into that space, planting trees, restoring forests, right, protecting the like, land invasion, illegal land invasion that could kill people. It's, it's a super dangerous activity. How do, they make, how do we make sure that the promised money actually comes? And what we do is we leverage the blockchain space, uh, technology, 21st century technology, that ensure that if you promise to pay, that money is going to leave your wallet first. So it's gone. But it's stored in the blockchain. And the moment we can measure the impact, it's getting released. So we do have the mathematical guarantee that the money comes to the communities, then incentivizes trust. And we're basically believing that 
technology can trust enhance this whole process, speeding up the urgent action we need. But I want to finish up with one last point because I, I just love this panel, I love to center on community-based uh, work, and I want to tell you some stories how working with communities actually enhanced our technology and made it so much better. Because I hear a lot of companies talking about, yeah, we need to involve communities, we need to involve them into our work, but what is it actually that you learn from them? Tell me one or two things, and they couldn't, they can't answer. So I'm gonna tell you some things, maybe some companies, people who are looking at it could learn. So first, we developed these AI algorithms, and then when the communities that worked on it looked at our predictions, they were like, wait a minute, that's not correct. That's not completely right. right? They helped us fine tune and debug things that only people on the site can understand. For example, things that are, um, that are biased by the way these algorithms are trained. They're trained on historic data. Historic data is oftentimes discriminatory to marginalized communities. So they helped us see this through, and because of their feedback, we were able to involve something called participatory mapping, involving communities to input additional data on the ground. And when we were visiting these communities, we realized that this is another potential to create a new job for them. Basically, instead of harvesting forest and wood, you can sustainably harvest the data from the forest to create even more trust because an investor, a donor, would be very thankful to see to be connected to the area. So now you have something that is like a 21st century technology, which you only need a mobile phone to take pictures from trees, to fly a small drone, and you can upskill these communities. And at the same time, you create trust in a whole financial system. And this is what Gainforce is doing. Thanks, David. I absolutely, can I jump on what you were saying? I absolutely love that. I created my nonprofit Code Green on the blockchain because of that, because of transparency, because of the pace of it. And you know exactly, you can follow the money. And funding has been something that, uh, you know, is very difficult. And uh, you can raise money, there can be pledged, but you, there is a lot of opacity around that. And the harnessing the power that is in the blockchain and also working with the communities that are also here in the space of the Web3 and blockchain. Correct. You actually can, um, you know, have so many people involved into actively doing something by educating them on what are the issues and they can be part of it. That's one of the reasons we are creating a social DAO because it's a democratic way to involve everybody and to give everybody a voice and also the opportunity to do something by proposing solutions and, and it, you can create a global movement that way and it's digital communities creating a bridge between these digital communities and uh, real world communities and coming Absolutely. together and partnering. That's it wonderful. Can be I, really I, I, I almost feel I need to lock you four in a room and get you to <laughs> cross pollinate your ideas and, and, mm. and help collaborate and find solutions and share those solutions. Unfortunately, you know, time is the most non-renewable resource of the planet and we are running out of time. Uh, so I'll just give each of you, just if you had one thing you could say to the audience in, in less than 30 seconds, what would that be to inspire them to, to move from anxiety to action? Start with David, 30 seconds or less. Humility. So whenever you come and develop your solutions, you have to be able to learn and listen to communities. We, know to, we need to understand what are we good at? So the Global North has the finances, has the technological power, but we do not know everything. We need to work with communities. We need to empower them. And only jointly, we could maybe create something, solutions that are technology-led, that are uh, indigenous-led, potentially. Um, and that's, that's just amazing, but we need to be open for that. Humility care. Um, action begets action, and some of the greatest action we can take right now to address the climate crisis is a global investment in grassroots-led climate solutions. I would say communities, community-driven projects. We have to empower people. And I would say we are the largest generation of youth in history. And as you've heard, we have chosen not to be victims. We're stepping up and making the change that we want to see. And so what everyone else can do is to actually inspire and support young people to build that momentum. But we cannot seem to be inspiring and supporting one people, young people on one hand, only to just crush them with the other. So we have to fully support and fully engage young people. So humility, com communities, action begets action. I think that's a good way to wrap up. I want to leave you with one last clip, which I think will sum up this discussion very nicely. Please, do we have that final clip? The thing about this issue is that it isn't going away anytime soon. 
In fact, it's likely going to get worse before it gets better. For me, I think the thing that I'm going to take away the most from this journey is just voicing how I feel, taking the time to check in on your friends and ask, how are you doing? And allowing space for us not to be okay as well, just to express that you're struggling because that's not only okay, but it's natural in the face of this crisis. For so long, I've allowed my climate anxiety to get on top of me. It likely will, at times, again in the future. But now I feel I have the tools to move past those dark moments. None of us can save the world on our own, but I've found that by realizing my anxiety is shared by many other young people around the world, by grieving for what I know will be lost, and by joining many others in taking action in my own community, where I live, I find it easier to cope. And even more than that, it's given me the belief that from our generation's climate anxiety can come the determination to really change our future and look after each other whilst doing so. So we, let's look out for each other and look out for the planet and turn anxiety to agency and action. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will join me in thanking my panel for a very inspiring session.